We're gonna give it a couple of minutes while everybody connects to their audio. We have a big audience today. I guess a lot of people wanna know about Mind Over Bladder. So <laughs> that's really cool. Hope everyone's having a good day. Thanks for joining us today on this Wednesday. As always, I encourage you to open up your chat and tell us where you're coming from. It just so happens today that my two friends on either side, Calissa and Erica, are both in Wisconsin. So they're probably not as warm today as I am. Um, but yeah, I always like to know where everybody's coming in from. And of course, I want you to get used to the chat feature because we're going to, you know, if you want to ask questions, we really encourage that. Hey, Texas. Hey, California. Hi, Maryland. Um, also, if anybody needs, if you look on the bottom of your screen, there's three dots above the word more. If you click on those, you can always use closed captions if necessary. Um, Erica has graciously agreed to share her slides with us. So when we post the video of this, this is being recorded, we'll also have the slides. Without further ado, I'd love to introduce you all to Erica Vitek. She has a lot of alphabet soup off after her name, so I'm not going to read all of that. But Erica is a certified LSVT big practitioner with the Aurora Healthcare Therapy Team at Aurora Sinai Medical Center in Wisconsin. She's also a faculty member at LSVT Global Incorporated. She is board certified by the Biofeedback Certification International Alliance in Biofeedback for Pelvic Muscle Dysfunction and a Herman and Wallace Pelvic Rehabilitation Institute board certified pelvic rehabilitation practitioner. Ms. Vitek graduated with a master's degree in occupational therapy from Concordia University and has received extensive postgraduate rehabilitation education in the area of Parkinson's disease, pelvic floor disorders, and exercise. She has authored a course called Neurologic Conditions on Pelvic Floor Rehab as a faculty member with the Herman and Wallace Pelvic Rehabilitation Institute using her two specialty areas of practice. Erica, thanks for joining us today. We're so happy you're here. Thank you so much, Eden. Yes. Hi, everyone. And it is definitely not super warm here today, although I've been with patients all morning and haven't touched the outside air since so oh, 630 or so this morning, but it's a little sunny, but not warm. So in Milwaukee here. So thank you so much for, for joining us today. And I do have some slides that I can go ahead and screen share. Uh, during my presentation, as Eden mentioned, I'm happy to share them for posting, uh, post my presentation with the recording. So I'll go ahead and share my screen now. Okay, so everybody can see that. And Eden, please just let me know if there's any issues on, on that end. And, okay, great, excellent. All right, so... I am very passionate about this area, uh, this topic, this area of practice. So as Eden mentioned, my specialty area both lies in Parkinson uh, disease and exercise therapies, as well as pelvic health type conditions. So I, I'm very, very passionate about teaching people, and I love to talk with people that have Parkinson's to help them with these conditions because most of the time we talk about motor symptoms of Parkinson's, at least with physicians and kind of treatments. But in regards to non-motor symptoms, they're a little more challenging. Uh, they affect the quality of life a little bit more here and there, uh, get in the way of things that we want to enjoy and do on a day-to-day -day basis. And so having a really good cooperative bladder and bowel can be very, very helpful for a day-to-day -day living. So I hope to provide you today with uh, some tips and some things you can go away with, and we'll try some activities together as well. I have uh, done presentations similar to this before, but I've added some interactive things that we can try together today, uh, trying to visualize some things as well. All right, so let me get my slides started here. Here we go. All right, so first... Erica, I'm going to interrupt real quick. There's like a column in the middle of the screen that's blocking the slide. Oh, like okay. we see some of the slide and then we see like a column. I gotcha. You know what? Let me see if I can. You just you moved it over. So now it's not so something like you're doing something with it. Okay. Yep. Let me try yep. to, there we go. Does Perfect. that thank you. seem better? Okay. Thank you so much. All right. So kind of what we will 
talk about today, just our, our list. I'll just go over that in brief and then we'll get right into it. So we're going to talk about what the pelvic floor muscles are. We're going to define what really normal bladder and bowel function is, uh, demonstrate how the pelvic floor muscle contributes to that normal bowel and bladder functioning. We're going to go ahead and talk about uh, symptoms and common experiences of people with Parkinson's disease. And we know not everyone experiences the same symptoms per se, but I can um, discuss with you the really common things that happen with the bowel and bladder or common things that I even see in the clinic here uh, as a treating clinician and describe to you some of the things and why that is happening. And then we'll, we'll explore some of the causes. So the dopamine and how the brain is affecting kind of the downstream bladder and bowel function. We'll talk about some lifestyle tips, some things that can you can really take away right away today and hopefully will impact your day to day. And then we'll try to learn how to find our pelvic floor muscle uh, to be used for better bladder and bowel function. And then we'll do some other techniques to have a successful daily bowel movement toward the end. All right. So first off, let's talk about what the pelvic floor muscles are. So really, they're a sling of muscles that go from the front to the back of our pelvis. So they attach at the pubic bone in the front, and then they go and kind of sling or make like a hammock all the way back to your tailbone in the back. And so they form kind of like a, a bowl or hammock at the base of your pelvis. And we like to think about the functions as the five S's. And so the first function being sphincteric, meaning it helps you to control or allow closure of the urethra to help control urination, either closing it or opening it as needed to be able to um, help you with bowel movement to open or close as needed. Uh, to control gas, uh, whether you are trying to let it out or keep it in. So we can have that closure or opening as needed. The second function is for support. So it provides a shelf to the bladder, to the uterus in women, to the prostate in men, and to the rectum colon area. So sometimes that's why you kind of think about it being referred to as not just the pelvic muscles, but the pelvic floor muscles being that shelf of holding everything up. It also has sexual functions. So for erection in men, for orgasm in general, uh, as well participate in that for women. And then stabilization. So the pelvic floor kind of works with our core musculature. So it provides uh, contraction or tightening to help us with our core for our posture, for our balance when we're walking. And so uh, that stabilization occurs in conjunction with your pelvic floor musculature. And then it also, that last S is the sump pump. So it can help with circulation of blood flow from the lower body with getting fluid back to the heart. So this is a side view of the pelvic floor muscles. And so what we see on the left-hand side is the male and on the right-hand side, the female. And so in the male pelvic floor, we can see the red is the pelvic floor musculature. So that bowl or sling at the base of the pelvis. And in men, that pelvic floor muscle is just below the prostate. And then the bladder is just above the prostate. So you can kind of see uh, that there where the bladder here, prostate here, pelvic floor here, and then the urethra, which is the tube that exits your bladder right here, comes through all that space and through the pelvic floor. Also surrounds the anorectum here. Then in the female, we have kind of a, a similar um, view from the side here, but we add the vaginal canal here because the uterus sits just above the bladder. So we have bladder, the urethra runs through the pelvic floor, the uterus just sitting like above your bladder, and then the vaginal canal through the pelvic floor, and then the anal rectum here through the pelvic floor. And so just wanted to kind of uh, get us oriented to the location in both the male and female pelvic, um, pelvic region. So let's talk about the normal bladder. So the average bladder holds about two cups of urine. So that, that is about 400 to 600 cc's or so, 16 ounces, somewhere in that range. And the average person urinates about five to eight times per day or once every two to five hours. The first sensation of needing to go is typically when the bladder is about half full. So about 200 to 300 cc's 
or about eight to 10 or so ounces. And that's when the bladder is like, hey, might need to go to the bathroom right now. Uh, just kind of giving you that first little indication, but yet you can kind of hold it off and wait a little bit to go. Also, the bladder should empty completely each time you go to the bathroom with no uh, urine leakage at any time. Waking uh, zero to one times per night to go to the bathroom. So not getting up more than that one time a night is in that, uh, that average range or average zone. Now, another thing I get asked a lot is, you know, what, what should the urine look like? Or how do I know how much water I should drink? And this is a great little chart or little visual to kind of think about. You really want the urine to be in approximately the range of like a light lemonade type color and not too dark so that you know that you are hydrated. And you can see I'm hydrating. Been talking all day. And I talked all day yesterday at a Parkinson's event that we had in town here. So just trying to keep up with the hydration as well. And so the urine, when you see it that color, then you know you're probably properly hydrated. When it's really, really light in color, you may be actually slightly overhydrated. And when it's really dark in color, you know that you're potentially dehydrated. And you really uh, don't want the bladder to kind of get aggravated over the dehydrated level. The bladder will sense kind of the acidity of the urine being much higher, and you'll get kind of more urgency or frequency with that darker color of urine. So we want to kind of be right in that zone. And sometimes that for some people, that's eight cups of water a day. For other people, that might not be kind of that eight cups a day that they used to kind of say for everyone to have that eight, eight glasses of water a day. Uh, for some people, you don't need that much, or maybe you need a little bit more. Uh, the other current recommendations, some are saying about half your body weight in ounces is what you should drink per day. Now, during my talk yesterday, when I did a similar uh, talk to a crowd, uh, the gentleman sitting right in front of me had these, this great water bottle that I tend to recommend for people who struggle to kind of keep up with their water intake. And it had, you know, by 8 a.m. you should be here, by 9 a.m. here, by 10 a.m. here, and all the way down. So thinking about uh, having that much water by utilizing the water bottle as the reminder is a pretty cool thing just to help you if you uh, struggle taking in water uh, during the day because it also helps the bowels as well. All right, so let's talk about more about what really the bladder does. Okay, so the bladder itself is a storage kind of vessel for urine. Okay. What's supposed to happen is the bladder is supposed to be in kind of this relaxed position and it's supposed to store urine. And while it's storing this urine, it remains in this nice relaxed state because it is a muscle itself. It's called the detrusor muscle. And it's supposed to be nice and relaxed, not giving you much signals. And really your sphincter and your pelvic floor muscles might be a little bit activated, but you're not consciously aware of it. It's just kind of keeping things under control so we don't walk around and have leaking. Then there's this transition stage where your your brain and you start just getting this awareness this conscious awareness of like yeah there's maybe a little bit of like fullness happening right now but you can still ignore it but you notice you know maybe i have to find a restroom soon you can kind of ignore the urge to go maybe you already know how to tighten your pelvic floor muscle and you use that to kind of uh, surpass that feeling and you can go ahead and inhibit it by doing that contraction it puts the bladder back into that relaxed state so it can continue to store more urine. However, it will not continue to store urine forever. You eventually do have to find the bathroom. So then there's the emptying phase where the bladder actually contracts. So the bladder muscle, the detrusor muscle, actually does a contracting to squeeze the urine out while you consciously are able to relax the sphincter and the pelvic floor muscles. So everything in the pelvic floor can just like come down and relax and open and the bladder does all the work for you. So let's talk about a little bit in regards to the incontinence. So I want you to look at that left-hand picture. And in that picture of the bladder, we see some arrows on the inside demonstrating that the bladder is very full and the bladder, the urine is kind of pushing on the edges of the bladder. And then you see a little bit of leakage coming out of the urethra on the bottom. Now this would be referred to as something called overflow incontinence. And what happens is the bladder kind of overfills or gets like so full that it can no longer hold anymore and a little bit starts to leak out. 
Now this can be due to decreased sensory awareness of like bladder filling. And so maybe you don't even know that the bladder is totally full and you didn't even realize that you had to go and now you start to leak. Uh, so in the clinic here where I treat patients, I sometimes use what's called a bladder scan, or it's basically a bladder ultrasound to kind of check. If you go to the bathroom right now, and then you come back to my treatment room, and I do a little scan in your bladder, have you actually emptied your bladder? And so that can be something we can check on to make sure the bladder muscle is doing its job. Okay, so that's the first type of incontinence is overflow incontinence. The middle picture is typically refers to stress incontinence. And so stress incontinence is when you have this upper arrow of pressure, you see the, that downward pressure onto the bladder, that is like a cough, a laugh, a sneeze, okay? And then what happens is kind of squishes in on the bladder and then a little bit of urine uh, leaks out. And so that's called stress incontinence. So it's an increase in abdominal pressure. And so then because of that increase in intra-abdominal pressure, then we get a little bit of leakage out of the, the urethra. That last picture is typically what we see when you have urges that are uncontrollable. So the bladder is like, I am so overactive. I'm just getting a little crazy right now. And so the bladder's filling maybe only a little, like you see in the picture, like halfway. And the bladder's already like giving you signals, like I gotta go, gotta go, gotta go or put the key in the door or you pull in the garage and the bladder's like, hey y'all, I know the toilet's right there and you gotta go really bad um, because for whatever reason, the bladder just knows the toilet's right there and you gotta really quick rush in. So that's typically referred to as either overactive bladder or urge incontinence where you have an urge that actually causes a little bit of the leaking to happen. All right, so let's get on to the next one. Here we go. All right, so I wanted to just show you a little bit about the anatomy in the female and the male that can also cause some kind of secondary issues related to bladder function. So this is a female pelvis from the side, and there's something called prolapse that can happen. So on the left-hand side, we see the bladder and the uterus in the center and the rectum in the back here. So bladder, uterus, vaginal canal here, and the anal rectum back here. Now what can happen is the tissues that are holding up the uterus can get weakened. And then on the right-hand side of the screen, you can see how the, the uterus kind of falls down into the pelvis. Now this can be for a variety of reasons. It can be from a lifelong um, chronic coughing, it can be from a lifelong straining for bowel movements, uh, heavy lifting in your job or career. And then when the, the prolapse kind of sneaks down into the vaginal area, you can see how it kind of like almost like kinks off the bladder a little bit right here. Causes maybe like a little pocketing where maybe the bladder wouldn't empty fully. And so usually uh, doctors will diagnose a uh, prolapse uh, and that may be, you know, partially contributing to some of the bladder issues you might have, or even the bowel. So you can see kind of how sometimes it can cause pocketing in the bowel, which is right next to uh, the, uh, the uterus or vaginal canal as well. And so I also do assess and most pelvic health clinicians also are skilled in assessment of prolapse to if like your doctor hasn't caught that you have one of these or they have seen it and we just wanna like assess it further or do some confirmation about how it might be affecting your bowel or bladder uh, function. So that's in a female, one of the complications that could happen to complicate the matters uh, that we've uh, kind of already talked about with incontinence. Now the male bladder is sometimes disrupted by the prostate. So you can see the prostate on the left-hand side is the normal prostate just below the bladder in a male, where there's freedom of urine movement through the urethra down uh, out through the prostate area. On the right-hand side is a prostate enlargement. So that can be either benign, meaning there's really no uh, medical concern for the enlargement outside of the fact that it's kind of compressing on the tube or the urethra emptying here. Uh, or sometimes men develop prostate cancer. Uh, 
So uh, the prostate will kind of grow in size. We obviously have to determine if it's something we have to be more concerned about and maybe there needs to be a prostate removal or something more uh, addressed there. Or sometimes they do other procedures to kind of open this up, this area, so the urethra is more free. And then other times men will just take some medication. So for example, like Flomax might be one of the common ones you may have heard of, or Tamsulosin is another name for that. And that helps to kind of relax the prostate a little bit to let this area be free. Now, there are a lot of medications that can help with that. And uh, urologists are very good at knowing kind of uh, what to do about that. Uh, so those are just some other kind of secondary things. There, there are many other conditions one can have that could affect uh, your bladder, but these are probably two of the, of the most common kind of mechanical things or medical things that could happen in that region to affect your bladder and even your bowel. So I wanted to just share with you a little bit about Parkinson's disease and the bladder itself and how it might be different than what someone else might experience that doesn't have Parkinson's disease. So I have a little bit of a list here of probably the four most common things that can happen in someone with Parkinson's and their bladder. So what we're looking at in the little depiction there that I have the picture is the average bladder can kind of fill and be, um, you know, expand and open kind of like a balloon. And right next to it is kind of what the Parkinson's bladder probably looks like in most people is that it only expands uh, to a, a limited degree and that it may not even fill up even the space that it allows, but a very small amount may only fill up and you may only go a really small amount before you've now have, you have a really big urge to go to the bathroom. And so a lot of times uh, we'll have people do like a measured uh, diary where they'll use like a urine hat like you use in the hospital or like a urinal or something for me and do a documentation of say 24 hours maybe for a day or two or three uh, to get a good idea of what's coming out. And often what I see is that only very small amounts come out. So say maybe three ounces, four ounces, like 100 cc's, maybe 150 and going often. And so there's a lot of urgency and frequent going to the bathroom, yet the volume of urine coming out is a very small amount. And really what you want to be able to do is when you go to the bathroom, counting uh, about to, you know, the one, 1,000, two, 1,000 kind of counting, you want to be able to count to about 10, 1,000 or 12, 1,000. So you're getting about 10 to 12 ounces out. So each 1,000 is about an ounce of urine. And so if you can count to 10, 11, 12, 1,000, you know you're getting a good volume out. But many people with Parkinson's can actually only get out maybe 3, 1,000, 4, 1,000, 5, 1,000, somewhere in that range. And so the reason that that happens is the dopamine that's supposed to be being produced in the brain is actually supposed to keep the bladder in a state of storage or a state of calm while urine is filling into the bladder. Because there's a lack of dopamine and that communication path is a little bit disrupted, the bladder isn't being told to stay in storage mode. It's not being told to relax or let the urine come in. And so then that results in this feeling like you're more consciously aware that you got to go much sooner. And so there's usually like a threshold of the urge, right? So you get kind of that first indication, like I'm, I probably have to go soon. The second indication, like, yeah, I probably got to find the bathroom like really quick. And then once it hits the threshold, potentially it's so strong or you're already having urine coming out. And so in Parkinson's, that threshold comes much sooner. Sometimes people tell me it's like that, like the feeling and the leaking happens at exactly the same time. And so I work with people on trying to modify behavior and try not to go just in case to the bathroom so that we try to retrain the bladder to fill a little bit more. And we work on strengthening of the pelvic floor muscle, which we're going to talk about in just a little bit, to help reduce the urgency or postpone the urges so we can get the bladder to fill a little bit more. And the best way to know if you're filling your bladder a little bit more is by measuring how much comes out. So I work a lot in the clinic with that and public health clinicians throughout the entire United States are, are trained in these techniques. So uh, that would be a good uh, technique to try. Now, incontinence tends to be fairly common as well, and it usually is due to urgency. Uh, so that urge comes on really quick and then maybe a little bit of leakage. And then lastly on my list there is nocturia, which means you're getting up more than one time a night to go to the bathroom. 
And so the reason that this sometimes happens is sleep can be really challenging in people with Parkinson's. And so what happens is like your circadian rhythm that they say for sleep is like this rhythm of you get this more melatonin produced by your body in the night. You can go ahead and relax and sleep. And sometimes because sleep is not uh, regulated, then the bladder isn't in sleep mode. So the body produces a hormone that helps the bladder be a little more relaxed and a little more, uh, uh, the kidneys produce a little less urine at night because of that hormone. But when the melatonin isn't kicking in right, or things aren't working with your sleep, or you have sleep apnea, uh, or, or think or if you're wearing a CPAP, that might keep you uh, asleep. But if you have sleep apnea that's untreated or something like that, that can also keep your bladder awake at night. Now your bladder thinks it's daytime, your kidneys thinks it's the daytime, and you produce more urine at night. So when we're younger, the average person produces about 15% of their urine at nighttime. When we're older, we produce 30, 40, maybe 50% of our urine at night. And when I look at a, a measured diary of somebody that comes to see me and, and we kind of look at how much urine is coming out at night during the day, Sometimes people with Parkinson's produce really high amounts of urine in the middle of the night. Sometimes that 40 or 50% of their urine is coming out at nighttime. And so we can work on uh, techniques of trying to shift fluid drinking to earlier in the day and try to adjust to see if we can reduce those volumes at night and also improve improving sleep with all the techniques that um, wonderful sleep specialists know and uh, sleep hygiene and things like that that you may have heard about. The other thing with nocturia that I just want you to be aware of is if you have orthostatic hypotension, so that's the dropping of the blood pressure when you go from a sitting to a standing position. And so if you have that problem, what happens is those individuals tend to produce more urine at nighttime as well. The reason for that is that during the day, you're told like load fluids, load fluids, or you're on medication to help keep those fluids in the bloodstream so your blood pressure can stay up. Then what happens is you go to lay down at nighttime and now the body is like, okay, the blood pressure is going up now, you're laying down, Everything is a little bit different when we take away gravity. And now the kidneys and the, and the body are like, we need to get rid of some of this fluid to normalize the blood pressure. And so orthostatic hypotension is a really challenging thing to deal with for nighttime urination uh, and something you may need to talk to your doctor about a little bit more. But I just wanted you to be aware that, yes, we're trying to load fluids during the day, but then that can sometimes affect that nighttime and lots of volume at nighttime in that circumstance. So let's just switch over to normal bowel and then we're going to get into some techniques and, and lifestyle things. So the normal bowel is uh, going three times a week to three times a day. Now the average person, if they go once a day, feels pretty good. So seven bowel movements a week is really good. Uh, and usually your body can feel pretty, pretty great in that regard. This is the range of kind of the, the medical uh, description of what normal bowel habits uh, can range from. No leakage of stool should happen at any time. The consistency should be fairly soft and formed. Um, and then the awareness. So you should have some sensory awareness that there's stool present when you do need to go to the bathroom. So this is a great little chart that I, I like to show or ask about in regards to consistency of stool. So type four is the sausage-like stool that you want it to look like. So type four is kind of your goal area. If you're at type one, it's probably more constipated and type seven, it's like really too liquidy, sometimes very hard to hold. And in the type seven area is when you really need good strong pelvic floor muscles. And sometimes even the strength of your pelvic floor cannot surpass or overcome liquidy stool. So type four is your go-to, sausage, snake-like. The normal events of kind of the bowel function are that you have this reflex that happens in the morning. Get up in the morning, we ingest some food or some fluid or maybe coffee, and we kind of initiate this mass, what we call peristalsis, which is movement of the gut. And during that time, involuntarily, our body is trying to control any bowels from happening. We're not maybe in the bathroom, we're not ready for that. And our sphincter and pelvic floor muscles just are kind of in a contracted like state. 
then we can become aware that there's bowel material there. And the rectum is stretching just like the bladder does. So the rectum stretches and it sends this urge sensation. You get this feeling like I do probably need to go soon uh, and you can seek the restroom. In that case, if you're not near the restroom yet, you can squeeze your pelvic floor muscles to try to inhibit that sensation for just a little bit and retain the feces until you get to the restroom. And then it, the rectum can be in storage mode just briefly while you find the bathroom. Then we have the evacuation stage where the rectum actually squeezes and contracts to let stool out and the sphincter and the pelvic floor muscles are actually supposed to relax or kind of drop open in order to do that. And then you get a completion section where the rectum now goes back into a relaxed state so it can store more bowels or more feces. And the, your sphincter and your pelvic floor muscles now kind of go back into that contracted or closed position to um, get ready for the next uh, volume that comes into the rectum. So when we think about Parkinson's and the bowel system, kind of like three areas that I like to focus on and kind of figure out where the issues might be lying. So first one is slow motility. So dopamine allows for bowels to work a little faster. So in your gut, your large intestine, which I have in this picture here, is uh, helped by dopamine. When dopamine is a little more prevalent and you have that dopamine replacement, then the bowels work a little bit better. So the gut does rely on dopamine. So the, the slowness that we see in the, in the bowels can be similar to the slowness we see with muscle movement in general. Additionally, when we think about having a bowel movement, the abdominals have to contribute to kind of the push or not straining, but using a little bit of effort in the abdomen in order to get the rectum to actually empty. And so because other muscles uh, that you know, you know, like your hands, your, your fine motor coordination, the coordination of your legs for walking, uh, your posture muscles, since those muscles <clears throat> aren't maybe working optimally, we think that the abdominal muscles also could be not working optimally for the bowel movement as well. And they really do need to contribute to the bowel movement. I'm gonna teach you some ways to do that um, toward the end of our talk today here. Then there's the emptying. So the pelvic floor muscle is a voluntary muscle at the exit. So right at the bottom here, we need to be able to have that muscle relax and drop open while the rectum does the squeezing to get the stool out. So that coordination sometimes isn't working right, just as if you're trying to coordinate arm swing and walking or arm movements at the same time you're um, doing something else as far as like reaching and how your balance is and things like that. So everything has to be coordinated together and the bowels sometimes aren't that coordinated either because of the dopamine um, deficit from Parkinson's. All right, so those are kind of the three areas in the bowel. Now let's talk about just some lifestyle tips for a better bladder. So drinking water, super important. We kind of addressed that already. Limiting fluids after dinner can help the nighttime, not getting up as much. Uh, sometimes I'm even more aggressive than that and stopping fluids around 3.30 in the afternoon, um, except for dinner or medication, um, because the nighttime can be so significant for some people. So sometimes I say before 3.30, we're gonna shift everything. You're gonna take in lots of fluids during the day. 3.30 will cut off the major fluid intake. You have four to six ounces at dinner and then with medication and then no more fluids. So that can sometimes be really helpful for the nighttime. Call that fluid shifting. Then avoiding bladder irritants. So caffeine, uh, carbonation, acidity, like orange juice or grapefruit. Sometimes those things, taking those things out can really be helpful. I had, <clears throat> excuse me, one lady who took away um, having a lemon in her water and uh, that like solved everything. So uh, sometimes it can be that easy and sometimes it's not that easy, but just as an example of how acidity can kind of uh, affect that sometimes. And then you really want to avoid regular just going to the bathroom just in case. So if your bladder constantly is like, I'm going to empty at three ounces and, and we're going to empty again as we three ounces and bladder kind of learns like, okay, next time we're at three ounces, I'm going to tell you about it. And it's like, Hey y'all remember last time you emptied me when I only had three ounces. And so 
really important to not train your bladder to empty when it has really, really uh, small amounts in it. And then, you know, really take your time when you're on the toilet. Make sure you relax your muscles, let everything come out, make sure the bladder gets fully emptied. Having a daily bowel movement, super important because there's only so much space in the pelvis, only so much real estate, some say. And so we don't want the bowels to be pushing on the bladder. So we want the bladder to have enough space. We want it to have enough room to expand, to hold the urine that you need it to hold. We don't want you to rush when you have an urge. So when you have an urge to go, you want to try to kind of stay calm or take a few breaths. And then from there, maybe even use your pelvic floor muscles and do a little bit of a contraction to tighten and calm your bladder. Once the urge calms down, then walking to the bathroom. Squeeze before you sneeze. So sometimes we call this like pelvic bracing, where you kind of brace for a little pressure that's going to be in your abdomen. And so with that pressure that goes down in the abdomen, then by squeezing from the bottom, tightening that pelvic floor, you can try to hopefully prevent uh, that leakage from happening. And that would be for coughing or laughing, anything that puts that pressure downward on your bladder. All right, then some other lifestyle tips for a bowel, a better bowel, the drinking water, top of the list again, just like with the bladder. And so that's super important. Um, and then, oh, I'm realizing I have a little typo there. Eat 25 to 35 grams of fiber per day. So if you want to make a little note of that. When you eat a lot more fiber, when you add fiber to the diet, sometimes the gut moves a little slower in people with Parkinson's. So you want to kind of add fiber a little bit slower and not go like full bore, right, to 35 grams a day. But if you eat a lot of fiber and don't drink enough water, that can also stop you up as well. Water activates the fiber and helps the fiber to work the way we want it to, to get things to push through. The other thing you can try is that gastrocolic reflex that happens in the morning. You can try a warm drink in the morning to try to help facilitate things moving along. Um, that can sometimes really uh, wake things up. Some people say coffee really works for them. And um, some of that is the caffeine and some of that can just be the warmth. So if you prefer not to have the caffeine, uh, the just having something warm can also help. Sitting on the toilet in a routine time. So always choosing like that same or similar time of day Preferably even after a meal, because you're kind of kicking in that reflex from your um, what you've eaten or what you've drank and kind of get the colon kicked in after that. Sitting in a proper position, so you may have heard of the squatty potty. It's a great way to sit because you're kind of in a squat position. You get a stool under your feet and lean forward on your elbows. Your knees are kind of higher than your hips. And that allows the pelvic floor to really kind of drop down and open so that the rectum can have good signal to empty good. Uh, relax and really take slow, what we call full breaths, meaning breathe in and down into the belly. So you can really feel that breath going way down into the belly. And then you can, from there, kind of feel, hopefully, the breath kind of pushing the pelvic floor open. Uh, and I'm going to talk about that even a little bit more in a moment with the breathing activity. And then you want to try to refrain from pushing really hard, like breath holding, like and, and holding or closing the throat and taking that big straining breath, um, strain with a breath hold, um, because a lot of times that actually closes up the pelvic floor. And then you want to try not to avoid the urge to go, because a lot of times if we avoid the urge for the bowel movement, sometimes it doesn't come back like as easily the bladder urge that comes back. But the bowel urge sometimes disappears and then the rectum kind of what we call accommodates and kind of gets even bigger to hold more stool or um, more um, bowel in that area. And then you sort of start losing the sensation of needing to go because it's been like overstretched a little bit. So you really want to try to avoid, um, uh, avoid not answering the urge to go to the bathroom. Okay, so let's think about finding your pelvis. So I want you to be sitting in um, your chair there. And we're going to go ahead and I want you to think about locating where your pelvis is, okay? And so with your position in the chair, I want you to kind of think about bringing your, your head up toward the ceiling and kind of think about pushing up from the seat to push up your posture 
And I want you to feel it from the seat and from your pelvis in the chair. And so you can kind of see from the picture that first, uh, let's look at actually the one on the right. So thinking about a bowl, if your pelvis is like a bowl and you tilt it forward, that's like spilling the bowl forward and tipping it backwards spills the bowl backward. So when you tip the bowl forward, you kind of feel like you can sit really tall and up. And when you kind of roll or tip the bowl backwards, it's kind of like that slouch position. And so really it's moving the pelvis forward and backwards, just trying to find where that pelvis is located. And the picture on the left is showing a pillow being in the front and a pillow being in the back, meaning like push on the pillow with your pelvis in front as another imagery and push on the pillow in the back as another way to think about, you know, how to make that pelvis move. Now, in, in people with Parkinson's, sometimes this movement is what we would call like rigid or stiff because those muscles really don't want to move in those directions. And so that this can be a really nice way uh, to facilitate kind of getting that pelvis moving a little bit more. And then we can try to find the pelvic floor. And so this is a pelvic floor muscle contraction. Sometimes it's referred to as a Kegel exercise. And so you can see the pelvic floor in the pink there. And what's happening is you can see that rise and fall, rise and fall. And I want you to think about the muscle as being able to kind of close and lift in, close and lift in. And it's a lift up like toward the inside, uh, toward up in, uh, the abdomen. Okay, so you're thinking about bringing the pubic bone and the tailbone kind of together and like lifting up and in, up and in. Okay, now that motion should be private. So say, for example, if you are in a room where there's other people around and you need to hold an urge, we should be able to do this motion, tighten this muscle without anyone knowing that you're doing it. So it's a private motion. And I want you to be able to try to just feel what that feels like to close and tighten that in. This is another kind of visualization of how to think about it. So like the pelvic floor muscle being like a hammock and holding the bladder and that we can allow the hammock to rise, to lift the bladder or hold the bladder and fall to let the bladder empty, which is the water below. <laughs> so holding the bladder up is like letting that hammock come up and bringing it down is letting it come down. So this is different than the pelvic tilts that I talked about initially. That's more of just awareness, getting aware of the pelvis. This is a private motion that no one can see, that you can lift that hammock and no one is aware that you're doing it. So let's think about the pelvic floor squeezing closed in this way here. So the first one on the left-hand side here is going to be a slow contraction. So these are typically easier for someone with Parkinson's rather than a quick contraction, which I'll show you next, because sometimes the muscles don't wanna move super quick. And so we wanna think about like tightening the muscle in, kind of like building the squeeze. So you close the muscle, lift in, squeeze, and relax. Closing, squeezing in, and relax. Okay, so that's about a three to five second hold there. And usually I tell people to do about 10 like longer holds like that, where they're kind of gently pulling in, squeezing in, relaxing 10 times, three times a day. And so that's a long or a, a, a sustained hold, maybe we'd call that. The second one is like a quick squeeze where you're just making the muscle go squeeze, relax, squeeze, relax, squeeze, relax. And it's pretty quick little harder to do, but can be very helpful for, for example, if you cough, if you sneeze, uh, if you need that quick reaction. Sometimes if you jump, <laughs> those kind of things. So it really helps to support that pelvic floor, that bladder, when you have that impact, that really quick impact. And so I also say doing 10 of those three times a day in the quick way also is very helpful. Uh, so you do both. Do some long ones, some slower ones, and then some fast ones. The fast ones are a little harder and may take a little bit more time to learn. Now in the clinic, I use something called biofeedback. And this is just one example of how biofeedback might look. So what biofeedback is, is really giving you a visual image of what's happening in your pelvic floor using a little bit of an internal uh, sensor. So we use 
a little sensor uh, vaginally most of the time for women uh, and anal rectally for men. And it's a, just a little plastic like uh, sensor that has electrodes on it that actually reads an active like a muscle um, EMG, if you know what that is, it's just reading a graph of your muscle onto a screen. <clears throat> and tell me a lot about your muscle function. And so this is just one way to, to image that on biofeedback, where when the rose is open, the pelvic floor muscle is relaxed. When the rose is closed, the pelvic floor muscle is closed. This is one of the more fun images, but there's also just kind of a line on the screen where you can make it rise when you're squeezing. You can make it fall when you're relaxing. So a lot of different options, but I just wanted to share with you one of the more fun ones uh, of a way that we can image um, pelvic floor in the pelvic floor clinic to try to help you understand the muscle, try to get better control of that quick squeeze, or try to get better control of a longer hold. This is another way to kind of imagine or think about the pelvic floor, just trying to give you other ideas if you're having trouble finding it. So kind of thinking of the pelvic floor like an elevator, that when we're just sitting at rest, our pelvic floor is kind of at the first floor. It's just kind of holding everything in place, holding everything right in this um, nice relaxed area, right? As we walk around throughout the day, it's just kind of hanging out at the first floor. But when we want to squeeze, we can kind of think about it like an elevator of, okay, we're closing, lifting second floor, third floor, fourth floor, relaxing back to relax, which is that first floor, and then second floor, third floor, fourth floor. Sometimes I have people try to work in those ranges where like, let's hold it at the second floor for about five seconds, third floor, five seconds, fourth floor, five seconds, and then relax. And so there's all different kinds of strengthening techniques we can do with the pelvic floor. And the elevator kind of lift uh, is one of the other techniques that I use. Now, also with movement, we can think about the pelvic floor contracting. So the little kind of white arch on the picture there is your pelvic floor. I want to kind of bring this up in regards to if you're sitting in the chair watching TV or you're getting out of bed in the morning, those are times where maybe like all of a sudden that urge comes on really quick or you wake up and you're like, I really have to go. But the minute I move, I'm going to have to pee. And I want to figure out a way to like control that so I don't pee on the way to the bathroom. So this is one of the ways you can do that. So what I want you to think about is you're sitting in the chair and you don't have to necessarily cross your arms. It's just the, the image that I have. If you're sitting in the chair, or you're sitting on the edge of your bed, you're going to tighten the green arrow being tighten the pelvic floor. And as you stand, I want you to exhale some air, keep the pelvic floor tight and exhale some air. And then you could walk to the bathroom. Okay. So if you want to try that now, you can tighten the pelvic floor, exhale air as you stand. And that relieves pressure off your bladder so that when you stand, you're not like holding your breath. Because if you try to tighten down there and then you go to try to stand and use effort and tighten and hold your breath, then that kind of pushes down on your bladder and can cause leakage. And so the best case scenario would be get really good control of your urge and just kind of calm everything down. Then do this technique so that you can try to tighten and hold while you exhale as you stand to try to make it to the bathroom on time without leaking. So I find that this is a, is a common complaint and hopefully that helps you if you are dealing with that on your end. Then let's talk about the bowels. So I've got a few things with that and then we'll go ahead and take some questions. So uh, this is an abdominal massage technique, right side of the body to the left side of the body. So we think about the large intestine. It starts at the lower right-hand side of your abdomen. And I want you to think, go ahead and kind of feel your belly down lower right-hand side and just make some circles, kind of dimpling the skin, make some circles on the skin and move up with those circles toward the rib cage. So you're starting down on the right. We're making circles with the hands, with your fingers, all the way up to under your rib cage. And then we're moving across under the rib cage with circles to your left hand side. Circle, circle, circles, and then down on the left hand side, all the way down. And then we get into the sigmoid and rectum here. So you can kind of even come toward the middle where you're below your belly button and down. You always want to go the right to left direction. That's the way the stool moves through the large intestine. So keeping that in mind, really going from right and up, across and down on the left, and then you can restart that. 
lot of times I have people even try this before they even get out of bed in the morning. So you wake up, as long as your bladder is under control and you don't have to rush, you could maybe do a little abdominal massage to kind of wake up the colon, wake up the bowel. Some people actually do it sitting on the toilet as well, just can kind of keep things um, woken up and like giving permission, like, come on, let's get ready. It's time that we got to take care of this. All right. And then I just wanted to show you a couple of constipation yoga kind of movements. Um, these are uh, some things that I learned even from a, a yoga therapist who did a presentation for the Parkinson's Foundation. And I just have found this really, really helpful in my practice. Um, and I'm just going to bring up just so I can see where I'm at on the screen. That little box before was me on video. So I just want to make sure you can see me. I just kind of hopefully have that on the side and it doesn't bother you too much there. Okay, so you can see me here. I'm in my treatment room. Okay, and what I want you to try is just go ahead and kind of sitting up nice and tall. And we're going to think about a breath in, arms up, and a breath out, arms down. Okay, let's do that again. Breath in, arms up, and breath out, arms down. One more time up, and then we're gonna change it up a little. I want you to bring your right hand, and I'll do opposite you so we can do it together. Right hand down on the edge of the chair, and I just want you to side bend. Just kind of feel how that opens up the abdomen right here. And take some nice deep breaths into that area. So really think about a full breath down into that area. And then you bring your arms back up and switch. Left arm comes down, hangs onto the side of the chair and side bend. And I want you to feel that deep breath going into the abdomen here and feel that you can kind of stretch the abdomen with a deep full breath. And you do a few of those and then both arms back up and down and bring them to your knees. And I want you to just do a little bit of shoulder rolls for me. So the reason for this is to kind of open up that rib cage so we can go forward and back about three times each. Just open up that rib cage. You know how that colon comes right under this rib cage here. Just letting those ribs move around, give it some space. And then take a breath in again for me. And now we're gonna reach across the body. So let's take this arm down and we're gonna almost like twist. And again, opening up the side of the body here. The other hand is reaching towards your, your calf area here or your shin. And you would do the same deep breathing in that position. And then you'd follow that back with arms overhead and switch, okay? Arms overhead and switch into side bend the other side. And same thing, nice deep full breaths into the belly. And then we bring arms back up together and come down into what we call a forward fold. You're gonna lean down and let the body feel at abdominal tightness uh, against your legs. And just kind of cross your arms over either at your shoulders or your knees. And kind of just tuck your head down. And from there, just really breathe into the belly and feel that compression in the belly against your legs. And you would do that a few times as well. And then we would come back up and back to the legs, okay? All right, good. So everything is like opening up that area. The last pose is called the wind releasing pose. I did not come up with this. This was the <laughs> yoga person that used that term, but you basically just kind of hug your leg. You can rest your heel on the edge of the chair if you're able to, uh, and you just hug and kind of curl over your leg and do that same deep breathing. And you're really just trying to get air into your belly and you hold that position for a few breaths and you switch and do the other side as well. So the wind releasing pose. <laughs> and just kind of compressing the belly. So it's really all about using the breath and trying to open up the belly. All right, so that's just a little example of some, some positions that you could try. Uh, and then the last slide that I have, let me just uh, take this video thing off of here again so you can see. Oh, I have two more slides. Sorry. Um, four, seven, eight breathing. So let's just listen to this together. 
and watch. We're gonna breathe in for four. I want you to breathe into that belly for four pounds, really deep in the belly. Hold your breath for seven. Feel tightness around the colon with a breath hold and breathe out for eight. Putting that breath out. So it's in for four, hold for seven, breath out for eight. Here we go. In for four. Hold for seven. And feel tightness in your belly with that breath hold. Out for eight. So that's on YouTube and you can find four, seven, eight breathing. It's a great relaxation technique. Another little tip is that sometimes if the eight breath out, you use a little resistance either through your fist or through tight lips, like you have a straw that actually helps you do the pushing a little bit. It allows your, the air that you put in your belly and held it for seven. And now you use a little tightness on that air with tight lips or your fist. And it actually helps you do a little bit of pushing to get the bowels to move. Four, seven, eight breathing is also just a general relaxation technique. The bowels love when our body is relaxed, gives them permission to move. So another uh, great reason to use that technique. And then another thing to think about is just my image before, but that there's also a basement to the pelvic floor. So that first floor is when we're at rest throughout the day but the basement is opening for a bowel movement. And unless we open the pelvic floor, the rectum doesn't understand or doesn't give permission to go ahead and empty because the rectum is supposed to contract and let all the feces out. But if we don't get the pelvic floor open to the basement and learn how to do that, then uh, the rectum doesn't know what it should do. So that is another thing that I teach in my, um, in my therapy, as well as other clinicians around the United States uh, teach that, but you can try to think about it in this way to try to see if you can feel it or learn how to open that muscle as well. And then lastly, this is just a reference slide for you. Nari Clements, the name on this slide is a physical therapist who made a, a full meditations for pelvic health CD and, and it's on actually on YouTube as well. So you can go ahead and listen to her meditations for, for pelvic health helps to relax the pelvic area, but she has something called the toilet track. So one of the tracks on there is the toilet track and it's a 10 minute like toilet sitting activity that has different ways of breathing that helps to kind of uh, assist in everything that we've talked about today. So there's some deep sipping inhales with complete sighing exhales for relaxation. So the sipping is like sipping through a straw, getting air deep into the belly, which we've been talking a lot about today. The second one is using panting. So taking a big breath in, panting out to try to kind of pump those contents in the belly to help with the bowels. And then returning to four norm or excuse me, 10 normal breaths so that we don't, you know, lose our breath or, you know, feel lightheaded or anything from all the breathing activity we've been doing. Uh, and then she just talks about not bearing down um, more than for like a five count at the most uh, one time every one to two minutes when you have an urge. Super important to only bear down when you have an urge. Uh, and that protects your pelvic floor and helps you poop. Okay. Oh my goodness. It took me a whole hour. I'm so sorry it took so long, but I'm totally up for questions. If anyone wants to ask me some things, what do you think, Eden? <laughs> I'm going to combine a few because they're of the same subject matter. And um, so to start with, a few were about the color of the urine. Someone asked if you could actually drink too much if your urine's clear. Um, someone kind of said, well, you know, some meds and vitamins can affect the color of your urine. And somebody also said, you know, if I don't seem to drink a lot, but my urine is always light, is that okay? Or, you know, is there a reason for me? So people are just concerned now about the color of their urine. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a good question. So there is a, you can drink too much. You absolutely can. And overactive bladder can sometimes be because you're drinking too much. So that's a really good question. So, um, I think if the urine is around that color, uh, you, you are fairly hydrated and everybody has a different hydration 
level or ability. So uh, if you do have further concerns, though, you, you probably do want to talk to your doctor about that just to be sure, because there's so many other things um, like with your heart or with your circulation or other than kidneys that could need to be checked out if you do have concerns in that regard. So uh, when just thinking about hydration only just in my, <laughs> my area, uh, that would be kind of the goal. Um, to know if you're hydrated. But again, other medical conditions that you may need to be checked out if you have concern. What goes in should probably come out, right? So amount wise, if you're feeling like, wow, I drink so much and then I hardly go, that's another concern that could be something else medical as well. I have a question about the Kegel exercises. I guess there are devices that help with Kegels. So my question, somebody was asking, are those helpful for Parkinson's patients? And then someone asked, uh, someone else asked, how long does doing Kegel exercise take to work? Like when would you start to notice that this worked? Okay. Yes. Yeah, so there's a lot of different apps uh, that you can get on your phone and different like tools for using like your hips in different ways to get your pelvic muscle to work and things like that. Um, they do sometimes work for people, but honestly, the best is just using your own body uh, because it's not complicated. You don't have to insert something inside of you to check if you're doing it right. Um, unless you do that in a medical setting, that, that can be helpful sometimes. But honestly, those things sometimes, yeah, they can get you motivated. Like if that's how it gets you to do them, I'm all for it. But some of them are a little challenging to use. And sometimes people buy them and they use them a couple of times, but it's a hassle. So then they don't do it. Um, so doing it with your own body is really the ideal. Uh, and uh, really seeing a pelvic rehab specialist in this area could help you even optimize it further if you're having trouble or give you further advice on that. Yeah. Uh, and she and brought it up. I was going to say one uh, people, someone asked how long, about how long would it take to notice the change, but also how can you find a pelvic rehab specialist? Is there like LSVT Global, for example, lists its practitioners? Is there a way to find out who does this? Yes, very good question. So Herman and Wallace has a list of therapists uh, on their website. So Herman and Wallace Rehabilitation Institute, uh, they have a list of pelvic rehab uh, certified clinicians there. Uh, additionally, the APTA, which is the American Physical Therapy Association, they also have a board certification for pelvic health. Um, they have a women's health uh, specialty that they have, and they also list clinicians as well. So those are probably the two best ways. Uh, the other way would be through the Biofeedback um, Institute, uh, or actually they, they changed their name now, International Alliance, Biofeedback Certification International Alliance. They also have uh, practitioners listed that are certified in biofeedback for pelvic muscle dysfunction. Uh, so that would be another way to find someone as well. Hopefully your urologist or your general practitioner would be uh, able also to know someone in your area too, hopefully. Yeah. And, and how long it would take to work? That was the other question. Uh, is that usually, you know, when you go to the gym and start exercising other muscles of your body, sometimes it can take you know, eight to 12 weeks before you might notice like some actual physical changes to your body or like some really nice uh, muscle tone. With the pelvic floor, a lot of times just becoming aware of it and like, wow, I actually can squeeze this or relax this. We can maybe even see results within a week of response of your bladder, response of your bowel. And over time, we can optimize that. I usually say, you know, giving it a try for at least that eight to 12 weeks beyond some of those initial improvements you might notice by just being aware of it uh, can really give us a good idea of the intensity, how I was mentioning the intensity of doing 10 quick ones and 10 long ones uh, each day, every day. And that's about 60 squeezes a day. Uh, some people even say up to 90 to 120 squeezes a day uh, can be helpful, but um, at least starting with that 60 as a starting point and doing that for that amount of time. And then if you're still struggling, maybe seeking out some further help uh, to get some further advice on maybe if you're doing it wrong or if there's more uh, things we can try to do to get it stronger if you're still having trouble. Thank you, Erica. This has just been wonderful. I'm so very grateful for your time. Um, we did put some information in the chat, so I encourage everyone to save the chat. If you look, if your chat is open, you'll see a little smiley face and next to it is three little dots. If you click on the more, you can save your chat because we did put in links for um, 
edwinwallacebcia.org, uh, Herman Wallace, I'm sorry, <laughs> um, BCIA. Someone put in the link to the Neri Clemens Meditation for Pelvic Health Toilet Tract. So I really want to encourage you to save your chat. We have a tradition here at PMD Alliance, our wave of gratitude. Erica, we're so grateful for your time. I know you weren't feeling 100% and it was just so lovely that you came and you gave us your all and you just did a wonderful job and we're so grateful. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. I was so happy to be here. Thanks for having me.